So good morning and uh, welcome to the second day of our Asset Liability Management Workshop. Yesterday was a full day of discussion of ALM process and we covered quite a bit. We'll start today with a brief refresh of where we left off yesterday looking at the candidate uh, portfolios. Then we move on to our stakeholder panel followed by an opportunity for public comment. Finally, the board will indicate to staff their preference for a potential portfolio. And as I mentioned yesterday, with that information, staff will conduct additional analysis and return to the investment committee in December with the, uh, with the, uh, with the formal recommendation on the strategic asset allocation. Today is an important day, so let's get started. So Anne is trying to get my attention, so. <laughs> Hi, just to refresh a little more on yesterday, um, we talked about possibly moving the December decision around the asset allocation to February mm -hmm. with the idea yeah, that then right. the board could have all the information on the economic right. assumptions, demographic assumptions, mortality projections, yes. potential portfolio mixes, have it all together, know the impacts on funded status, rates, look at potentials for phasing in, and then make one big decision. So Sure, that's fine. I can yeah, I do talk recall with our you discussion. and the president yeah, right. about how to make that happen okay, in we'll do. February. Okay, so that's so duly noted. Okay, so with that, I will turn to Mr. Deere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you can imagine the process yesterday, we started at the top of a funnel. Uh, and we began to narrow things down through what I thought was a terrific discussion and dialogue back and forth. Uh, but the hope is by the uh, end of the session this morning, uh, we'll have narrowed it down to some concrete uh, uh, preferences that staff will be able to analyze in detail as the chairman indicated. So I just thought yesterday was exactly the kind of work boards and staff should have. I'm spending lots of time on the most important question. I think uh, Eric wanted to add something, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Robert Glazier for the for the stakeholder panel. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. Um, or to, I'm sorry, to Ben, and then to the, to Robert. <laughs> I missed the right. signal. Yeah. <laughs> we all missed it this morning, Joe. So it's okay. <laughs> yes. So again, good morning, um, Eric Bagason, Senior Investment Officer for Asset Allocation and Risk. Um, we obtained yesterday afternoon some feedback from a handful of the board members that <clears throat> actually was incredibly helpful. So I'm really thankful that, that we got this. But in that feedback, it was really apparent that I think a comment that I made created some degree of consternation and maybe confusion, uh, particularly in relation to the whole area of hedge funds. So the question had been asked, if the board allocates zero to hedge funds, what happens? And the way that I answered that question um, I indicated that staff would continue to deal with hedge funds as an active risk owned by the staff. That comment is only accurate if you as a board allow us to continue to engage with the hedge fund universe and engage hedge fund managers. If you as a board do not want the staff to engage in any activity, you certainly have control of that. And you have control of that through delegated authority. We as staff can only execute and engage in the parts of the marketplace that you allow us to. So certainly the board can stop that action or that activity, not just in relation to hedge funds, but in relation to any part of the portfolio. You have full control over that, <clears throat> excuse me, over that activity. I simply, the comment that I made, I was thinking of it more from the context of, I, I think, the approach that's been taken at CalSTRS, where the board identified a zero allocation to hedge funds but the staff is still allowed to develop the program. But that means that the risk of that program is owned, in essence, by the staff. It becomes an active risk of, of their implementation um, of their delegated authority. So I just wanted to make that very clear that you as a board absolutely can either allow or disallow the participation um, in any segment of the marketplace. You have full control over that. And again, that's carried out and executed through the delegated authority that um, attaches to you know, your power, you were the trustees of this organization. So I, I wanted to really clarify that point because I think it was misconstrued and, you know, I, I created some confusion with that. So I apologize for that comment. And Ms. Martha, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That is helpful. Do you know at CalSTRS, do they use a beta hedge or do they take it as really active risk? I'm honestly not sure. I'm not, uh, 
positive okay. as to how Chris Salman is going to approach that problem. Okay, thanks. Are there other questions, though, or comments in relation to that? Oh. Alan? There, there's no beta hedge. It's just a pure play. Other questions, comments? Curtis, did you have something you wanted to say? <laughs> okay, I just, I just wanted to clarify that point before we, we turn today's session over to Ben, though. So let there be no confusion on that. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Eric, for that clarification. Um, so now, Joe, we move on to Robert. Ben. ben. Me first. <laughs> we'll get this right after a while. <laughs> okay, uh, good morning, committee members. I'm Ben Meng, Senior Portfolio Manager of uh, Eyesight Allocation. First of all, we would like to thank you for the great comment, dialogue, and uh, uh, um, uh, questions you asked uh, 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 at the workshop uh, yesterday. Uh, you spoke, we heard. To the extent possible, overnight we added additional information to the deck uh, today to incorporate some of your comments. Uh, there are also clearly a number of other questions or issues you raised where we need to do uh, additional work on, which we'll come back to you on a later date. Uh, for example, on the efficient frontier, all the candidate portfolio we showed you yesterday range from the low sevens to the high sevens um, uh, expected return. And one of the questions came up yesterday on the efficient frontier. Uh, what if we uh, ha um, have a candidate portfolio with a lower return? So on that note, later on this morning, you will see you will have the opportunity to vote on which part of the efficient frontier or which region of the efficient frontier you would like us to do more work <coughs> on. Um, also, on the low volatility uh, strategy, we'll continue to do research to address uh, uh, the question, does low volatility diversify our portfolio to equity risk, as well as, uh, or how does it appear, uh, compare to uh, 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 ARS as a diversifier? So that's actually a great question. It dovetails into other questions about uh, ARS strategy. Uh, so once we step out from the traditional mean variance optimization framework, and start factoring, factoring in considerations such as uh, liquidity, transparency, income generating ability, and the fees, what is the most efficient and effective diversifier to our uh, equity risk in the portfolio? Is this ARS, is this a low wall strategy, or is a GFI, or the, uh, global uh, fixed income portfolio? So this is a very good question. We'll continue to research on this and come back to the board. Uh, on liquidity, there was a lot of uh, great uh, uh, questions uh, as well. Um, particularly, we were asked to provide capacities from the different uh, program areas to generate liquidity, such as security lending program, the uh, equity program. And uh, in addition, we'll do more cost and benefit analysis of uh, obtaining a corporate line of uh, credits. So that's on liquidity. Then on the roles uh, and constraints that uh, we have uh, we, we had a very uh, good discussion, particularly on uh, infrastructure as an asset class, because the um, infrastructure, based on our based on our capital market assumptions, provides very attractive risk adjusted uh, return uh, profile for for the total fund. However, given the market uh, capacity and also the size of our fund, currently we have uh, constraints in terms of ramping up the size of the program. And uh, also a, a point made by uh, Dr. Deere and a number of other board members that uh, uh, the observation is that the output of the asset allocation exercise in ballpark is dictated or determined by the constraints we put into the mean variance optimization. So on that note, later on this morning, the second vote, uh, voting exercise you will see is that you have the opportunity to vote on each one of the bending constraints that have a direct impact on output of the uh, policy portfolio. Uh, absolute, uh, on absolute return strategy, uh, two questions was posed. One was uh, why did we not include a pre preliminary candidate portfolio with a reduced exposure to hedge funds? So to address this concern, again, later on this morning, you will have the opportunity to vote on the constraints on ARS program uh, uh, if you would like to be higher or lower. So we'll provide you that opportunity later on this morning. The second question about ARS uh, raised was that, could we run a better for portfolio without an allocation to hedge funds? And the simple answer to that, we don't know yet. And we definitely would like to have the time to come back to you with a more uh, uh, definite answer on that question. Um, on flexible de-risking, I'm just going with the uh, chronological order of yesterday. 
on flexible uh, de risking in a few moments, I will uh, defer to uh, refer to our chief actuary, Alan Milligan, to recap on the discussion on flexible de risking. Uh, on preliminary candidate portfolios, um, the board asked to provide uh, the discount rate or possible uh, discount rate associated with each one of the uh, preliminary candidate portfolios. And we, uh, on this slide, we added the uh, very last row there with the potential discount uh, rate ran uh, ranges for each of the candidate portfolios. So we were able to add that information overnight for you. Um, finally, I s yes. Uh, ben, is that slide updated on our books? Um, that I don't know, Tiffany. No, so, so no, uh, uh, not yet. So you have to uh, look at the screen. So finally, as our uh, IC chair, Mr. Jones, laid out elegantly yesterday at the beginning of the workshop is that the objective today is for, for us to engage a further dialogue with you to present you with a preliminary options, not to decide on the uh, policy portfolio today. So uh, with that, um, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, so with that, I turn it over to Robert. Thank you, thank you very much, Ben. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you today to facilitate our stakeholder panel. As we know, over the past 24 hours, we've heard a lot of important information about some difficult and complex issues as they relate to the sustainability of our fund over the long term. But our work, obviously, would not be complete if we didn't have a chance to hear from those that matter most to us, those employers and employees whom we serve. So I'm joined today by four individuals um, who are in a key positions to be able to share with us their thoughts and perspectives on behalf of our employees, our employers, and our members. Um, just for very brief introductions, uh, Ron Bates is the city manager from Pico Rivera and has been in that role for three years, but he's also served as city manager of Southgate, La Habra Heights, and Buena Park during the course of his career, as well as other positions in the city of Anaheim. Prior to that, he had been a financial consultant and was president of the League of California Cities and the Southern California Association of Governments. To my direct right is Carrie Corder. She is the chief financial officer of the Cucamonga Valley Water District. She oversees all finance and administrative services, which includes the functions of accounting, customer service, purchasing, and IT divisions. She's worked for a professional public accounting firm and specialized in audits of school district and bank clients. She has also worked for the City of Claremont as the finance manager and the city treasurer. Dave Lowe at the end of the table has been a very familiar face here at CalPERS and in Sacramento. He's the executive director of the California School Employees Association, and he is the sixth executive director in CSEA's history and has been with the organization in a number of capacities since 1981. He also chairs the Labor Coalition, which includes legislative and political representatives from public employee unions across the state, as well as chairing the Californians for Retirement Security. These coalitions represent over a million public employees in California and deals with pension, health, and labor issues. And Ron Cottingham is the president, has been the president of the Police Officers Research Association of California, union representing more than 64,000 peace officers. He had been at the helm of PORAC for 10 years, the longest of any of the presidents in the history of PORAC. During that time, he's taken on many high-profile controversial issues from prison overcrowding and to the death penalty repeal initiative. He's a retired deputy for the San Diego County Sheriff's Department and has worked on Chelsea's Law to crack down on predators after the murder of San Diego County teenagers Amber Dubois and Chelsea King. And he also had a hand in developing Megan's Law that allows the public to see where registered sex offenders live. I hope you'll enjoy this panel that we'll have for you today. It's meant to be a dialogue. We have not asked for formal presentations, but we would like each of our panelists to sort of start out of the gate with just a little bit of their perspective. And I'll throw some questions to them. They'll engage in dialogue with one another and hopefully with all of you as board members and staff. So starting, uh, Carrie, if we could with you and then work our way down the panel, just if you could tell the board members a little bit about your perspective as to how you and your organization, your employees, your members sort of see this discussion that the board has been having of trying to balance our investment targets and risk and rate volatility, 
share with us a little bit about where you're coming from when you talk about these subjects. Thank you. And thank you for having us and uh, sh allowing us to share our perspective on this very important decision. Um, as you heard, I work for the Cucamonga Valley Water District, and we serve uh, a large population in the Inland Empire, which happened to be ground zero for the recession in Southern California. And uh, we experienced, um, you know, a lot of foreclosures. Um, we had to make some very drastic and quick decisions back in 2009. Uh, we reduced our workforce by 10 percent. We added a second retirement tier. We eliminated <laughs> retiree health care benefits. So we had to act quickly because we are serving our customers and we are very sensitive to anything that could impact the rates to our customers. So the, dis the discussion that is happening um, is very important to us. Um, Having a, a well-funded plan is extremely important to us so that we make sure that we give our employees and retirees the benefit that we promised. Uh, but we are very sensitive to increased rates, and our rates on average have been increasing about 6% each year since uh, 2009, and our projections through 2020 look like our rates will have doubled since 2009. So it's a very important decision, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of our two Rons, Ron Cottingham, first. Good morning, and uh, one slight correction. I hope to be retired on December 2nd. So uh, I'm, I'm moving in that direction. Unfortunately, or, 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 or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, I'm a, a member of the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, and San Diego County is a uh, 1937 act, but obviously you might think about 80% of our members in PORAC are involved in CalPERS, and the rest are spread out between charter cities. Uh, and 1937 Act uh, counties. So the, uh, the thing that we look at, obviously we, we want to see stability and balance in our retirement system. We want to have that stability going forward. We don't want to see a lot of volatility. Some things are out of our control. Uh, one of the, th what we look at from our perspective is we are an umbrella organization, a union of unions. Uh, and all of our members are suffering right now. They're still locally kind of recovering from this last recession, not fully recovered yet, uh, as coming out of that and making a series of concessions at the bargaining table with their cities and counties uh, since 2007, when that thing, when we really started getting hit at the bar bargaining table. Um, that's been going on. That is still going on. And now the, we are faced with PEPRA that came in in 2012. We haven't seen the full effects of that. Uh, as the new employees are coming in and getting hit with a 50% cost sharing. And the current employees are negotiating a higher share of cost sharing. Where in one of our cities, uh, the employees actually agreed to pick up uh, their 9% already plus 11% on the city side, so they're giving 20%. Uh, we have some cities in that are charter cities that are giving 22 to 26%, and one of our counties that's giving 26% already. So. All of this just keeps piling on and it gets harder and harder. They're still asking for concessions. They're still going for more cost sharing for employees because uh, collective bargaining allows them to go beyond what has been set in law. Uh, and what has been projected so far uh, that I've read is over the next six years, there'll be a possibility of a 27% increase in CalPERS rates. That equates to about 4.5% a year over six years. If what is projected to occur does occur. What I think we know there is that that would be anywhere between a 4 and a 5 percent hit to local government and their rates. And we know where local government will go after to get those rates. They seem to go after the employees. Everything seems to fall on the employees' backs in our current environment. So that's what we're looking at is how we can protect. We want to work with our cities and counties, and we believe we have the collective bargaining uh, arrangements that we that have been in place and we want to protect the retirement system that's obviously a goal but going forward we think we need to see some of these things settle out first before we look at another uh, assumed rate assumed rate of return uh, reduction going from seven and a half to seven and a quarter so. thank you Ron Bates. Thank you, Robert. Uh, let me start by first uh, thanking you for the wonderful uh, web broadcast that you do of your meetings and yesterday's meeting. I thought it was a, 
uh, I was able to listen to the economic presentation and much of the actuarial presentation. I thought it was very well done. Appreciate as somebody who wasn't here being able to hear most of the discussion and uh, learn from the uh, presentations. And I guess I would reflect uh, a little bit of what Ron said in that the position of cities, as you know, this doesn't come as a surprise, is uh, very strained and will continue uh, to be very strained. Uh, I just brought for you, this is the California uh, City News uh, report. Uh, facing budget deficits, Desert Hot Springs considers bankruptcy. So uh, I think this trend is, uh, is uh, continuing. And I do believe that we'll see some stability. I think your economic team explained this yesterday over the next three years where cities will start to do a little better. The sales tax will come in a little stronger. But I think after that, we're going to see a leveling off. And the period between uh, the next three years and when really the impact of PEPRA kicks in, which is about 15 years off, the, the stress on cities is, is going to be dramatic. Now, having said that, and, and I think this reflects that, having said that, on the other hand, we do have to protect our employees and follow through on the uh, what's been promised to them. And I think a lot of the work that Alan and his team do, has done is very, uh, very worthwhile and is helping to bring uh, stability. And I think we need to make sure we uh, continue in that program of not kicking the can down the road, certainly trying to be reasonable because cities don't want to have to try to support any larger and increase than is absolutely necessary. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I would uh, suggest to you that it's important that we provide adequate funding to PERS so that PERS is able to provide adequate funding uh, to our retirees. So I'll leave it at that. I have a number of other comments to make and some examples to give you as the discussion goes on. But I would just want to emphasize the fact that I think it's really important that we continue to appropriately fund uh, the retirement that most city elected officials have committed to over many years. Thanks, Ron. Dave? So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about it from our classified school employees perspective, but also some of our members of the of the coalition. Classified employees are among the lowest paid employees in the public schools and in the public sector. Um, the uh, According to the CalPERS facts at a glance, the uh, average classified employee uh, retirement is around twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month. Um, many of our employees work part-time. We've lost twenty thousand members of our union just to lay off in the last five years and uh, nobody's received raises. So it's, it's tough times out there for, for everybody. 85% uh, of our members took furloughs of anywhere from 5 to 15 days over the last five years. So uh, in addition to that, they pay large out-of-pockets for their health care. And it's not uh, an, un an unusual situation for a uh, paraeducator in the classroom or a school bus driver to sign their paycheck over to the school district for their share of health care. Um, and many of them take home seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a month and the, the share of their premium for health care is, is often that much. Um, more than half of our members don't get retirement health benefits. So when they retire, they retire with nothing and they have to pay for their own health care. So, um, so our members' situation is, is dire and Proposition 30's passage, the recovering economy is, is beginning to, it, we, we feel like we've hit bottom, but we certainly have not turned the corner in any respect. And uh, the fact that, that CalPERS is considering this, this asset allocation has dramatic impacts on our members because the uh, employer contribution rate uh, affects our members in terms of how much money is on the table. And the uh, fact that, that new employees share 50 percent of the normal cost, uh, every, every change impacts that as well. So uh, our members are you know, keenly aware of and, and very interested in not just this discussion, but the fact that CalPERS has, uh, cons is considering other areas that impact the contribution rate. For example, the smoothing decisions that were made recently have uh, very significant effects on the, on the uh, contribution rates. 
and uh, the mortality uh, studies have significant effects. So uh, we think that this discussion also needs to be viewed in context with various other decisions that are being made by CalPERS that affect the employer contribution rates and the employee contribution rates. Thanks, Dave. So sort of segueing off of uh, the last thing that Dave just mentioned here, um, CalPERS has been looking at a lot of different decisions in this ALM process over the past year and a half and more decisions to be made. Some of those very much um, looking at the risk when we took the smoothing policy decision that the board made um, definitely had an impact both on rates for our employers but also for the risk of the organization. As far as that balance, that's one of the things, there's not a specific decision that the board's making at this workshop, but they're really trying to, to gather the input and the information as to how to balance the, the risk that we want to take in our investment targets and then also that volatility for contribution rate potential increases. How do you or your organizations and your members sort of see that balance for yourselves? What's more important that being able to predict and sort of have some consistent level of contribution rate increase or level that you can predict for? Or is it being able to try and have the greatest reward with higher risk level? Open it up for discussion. Uh, Robert, uh, I think I can explain, and, and many of you already realize this, the, the budgeting at the city level. Uh, we're very susceptible to shocks. So when we get a big shock in our budget, it's difficult to deal with. And then I think the comments that you hear from the unions come into play, where unfortunately sometimes it does uh, you know, end up in less staffing. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is a major cutback in services. You just take a look at a situation like Detroit, and you can see that the service level is almost dropped to as close you, as you can get to uh, are the people of Detroit really getting services from their city government? So I, I guess the question in my mind is uh, anything that helps us with budget stability, even though it may be increases that are necessary, that to me is of value because then it's more predictable. We know what we're dealing with. We can adequately plan for it. When we see large jumps either up or down, but especially if they're going to be up, that is difficult for us to deal with and usually I think at the city level results in poor poor decision making. Dave? So this is not an either or situation. It's just not possible to view it as one is better than the other. Obviously everybody wants stability and everybody wants lower rates. Um, so I think that, that we have to look at this discussion in context. We can't just look at the asset allocation and the discount rate without looking at the bigger world that we're living in and the economic environment and the other decisions that you're making that affect the rates. And um, the fact that we are um, not in, you know, not really well into a recovery, but just sort of getting that the, you know, hitting hopefully the end of the downturn uh, puts us in an in a economic situation where uh, public agencies are fragile. They've made a lot of cuts. Employees have taken a lot of cuts, and as the economy re re recovers, uh, it is important to have a certain level of predictability. And already, I can see in the school arena, as Prop 30 kicks in, what we're hearing from um, school services and others is, well, you know, hold on to your money. CalPERS is going to be doubling your rate. Um, so there's a lot of fear out there. Uh, from agencies because of the smoothing decision, because of the, the, uh, the mortality decision, and because of what might happen in, in, in this arena. And uh, uh, they need to have some level of predictability in their budget. And, and when they see these decisions coming down the pipe, uh, they, they don't see predictability. They have a lot of fear that, that things are going to be happening outside of their control. And that creates a lot of consternation in the school districts and in, in the public agencies. Before I go to Ron, I think one of the things that Dave mentions is important for us to recognize. We were looking at the different review cycles as we were trying to prepare for this workshop and have materials that would be helpful. And part of our board policies require that whenever we do this asset allocation, the board makes decisions and looks at what's happening in the capital markets and then chooses the asset mix that we review the discount rate after that's been done to make sure we're still at the right place. And Dave, I think, accurately points out, you know, it's not just a one-time decision or it's not just one type of decision. 
whenever we have the economic assumptions then as part of that, the discount rate is also reviewed. So just looking back in the last nine years, the discount rate had been reviewed five times, but it's you know, not just that that's being focused on here today and as part of this ALM timeline over the two years, it's really that balance of where's the right place that the board wants to be at when considering the needs of our members and the needs of our employers. So there is that consistency to be able to plan, but sort of a fairness that there's not so much shock that hurts any one individual. Any, one of the things that we're potentially looking at is in the future being able to move so those review cycles are a little bit more consistent and aligned, which I'm hoping would also be able to give more predictability for our employers and then also for, the, for our members. But Ron, did you have some comments? Yes, actually, uh, you know, when you talk about the discount rate, I mean, uh, looking at some of the material that, that I had, I was not able, I was at a meeting yesterday of a coalition of law enforcement organizations throughout the state, a uh, different coalition other than PORAC, and, uh, uh, but I was sent some information, and in that it looks like in the last eight years you've lowered the discount rate twice, and now while you're not there yet, you're exploring that, and every time you do that, that has an adverse effect on us. But one of the things that in a roundtable discussion that we had, and again, as I emphasize that our members have been at the table finding out how to take less pay, how to give more back, how to pay more for health care, uh, plus now with PEPRA paying more for their, uh, for their uh, normal costs. Uh, one group, actually only two groups reported raises. One is getting 1% over the next three years. Uh, one is getting 1% a year for the next three years. So we can see that as we're crawling out of this thing, we're not crawling out of this in leaps and bounds. So that, that's kind of difficult also. But the everything I've always, I'm not a financial expert or wizard or anything, but everything I've heard about CalPERS since I've been up here and involved in this is that you are, you're projecting long range. And I'm going to steal something from Dave that, that he was said recently about what is occurring now with, with, with the smoothing that's been done and the potential 27%. Uh, you're looking at changing mort mortality information and now changing the discount, discount rate. So right now in one fell swoop, there's going to be a triple whammy. And where is that going to be felt? That's going to be felt in the pockets and, and the, the funding and the budgets for cities and counties throughout the state. But where are they going to go to get the money? They're going to go to their employees. And that's what we have to look at. We, we want to be partners. We believe we have been partners doing everything we can. But it's like, how many times can you go back and you look at the city of San Jose and what Mayor Reed has done there and a department that a few years ago was 1,500 police officers in the city patrolling and working that city is now right down about 1,000. And if you take out the number of employees that they have <laughs> injured and out on disability, it's about 950 that they have to actually patrol the streets. And in some of the other areas that we've, we've been hit like that, like Vallejo, uh, San Bernardino, Stockton, they're all now trying to hire officers because they took such a hit in officers leaving. The city of San Diego, there's still about, that they reported yesterday, there's still about 300 officers short of being up to a full contingent. Uh, this also impacts cities because it impacts the safety of your citizens. If it impacts the safety of your citizens and your businesses, who's going to want to come into those cities and do business and, do, and shop because they don't feel safe and they don't feel covered? Uh, and, and I guess maybe we're beating on, on the same horse or whatever, but whatever you do here is going to adversely affect the cities and counties. Whatever adversely affects the cities and counties is going to adversely affect the employees. Uh, it's doubly devastating on a current employee that's been there that, that's had a certain situation. New employees, they can come in with their eyes wide open, hopefully and be able to realize what situation they're going to be coming into. But what we're looking at now is things that will actually, all these rates, all these reductions, all these concessions that actually affect the employee that's out there currently working, believing they worked under a certain agreement, and now those agreements are slowly, not slowly, they're actually rapidly being eroded. So. Thanks, Ron. Gary? Well, from a perspective of a finance person who has to actually balance the budget and um, make the rate case, uh, predictability and stability is very important to us. And I definitely appreciate 
the advanced information we've been getting on our actuarial reports out to 2020. Um, this is key to us. Um, besides purchasing raw water, our employees are our second highest cost and our uh, CalPERS payment is our number one benefit cost. And so we've actually created, and we're presenting to our board tomorrow night, a wage and benefit model that is very detailed that goes out 30 years so that we can put the information that we receive into this model to see if we're going to have any surprises going forward. Um, our rates are set four to five years in advance. Uh, two of our largest customers are the city of Ranch Cucamonga as well as the city of Fontana. We serve Caltrans, the county of San Bernardino, and other, and lots of school districts in our city. So um, we're trying to provide stability to our customers so that they can plan in advance. So anything we can get in advance, stable, predictable rates is, is what we're looking for. So at the, again, I think Dave pointed out it may not have to be a choice, but when you're looking at CalPERS trying to pick an asset mix here, where we might be looking for higher returns that would have potentially greater volatility, but when those returns come in, a lower rate, is that something that you would be leaning towards or against? Yes, we are putting the decision to the panel. If you were to tell the board specifically, you know, where would you pick? Because some of these, I know it, you haven't had a lot of time to study these things, but the, the board doesn't have to make any type of change in the discount rate because we hear some of the concerns. Their asset classes here that they could pick a mix that keeps that the same, but different levels of risk. What kinds of thoughts do the panelists have for what the board's looking at for an asset mix? Well, first of all, I think that, that if you look at, at where other plans are, uh, NASRA did a study and you know, I know CalPERS has reduced the discount rate a, a few times. They're not, you're now at seven and a half percent. You know, 55 plans are at eight. Six, uh, another 11 are at 7.9. 16 at 7.75. So essentially, 86 plans are are uh, above the CalPERS of seven and a half. 26 are at seven and a half, and only eight are below. So I don't think CalPERS is out of whack with regard to where the discount rate is compared to other plans. And I know that there are some people that would advocate for a risk-free discount rate. Uh, you know, we think that that's completely irresponsible, uh, defies reality. And you know, I, there's also you know, what type of risk we're, we're trying to mitigate against. My understanding is, is that you know, there's, uh, you know, in some respects, there, you, know, you're, you can try to mitigate against another economic downturn like we just had, this, this 19, uh, you know, 2008 economic downturn, which is you know, the biggest economic downturn since the, since the Great Depression. So, so you know, it may need, you know, hopefully it will be another 70 years before we have uh, a, another economic downturn like that. Um, but so, so dramatically affecting the, uh, the discount rate to mitigate against that type of risk, I think, is, is not necessarily where, where our members feel the CalPERS board should go. Uh, we, we do want, uh, we, don't, we also, we don't feel like it's, uh, it makes sense to, to chase higher returns and, and, ex and, and increase the risk substantially. We believe the CalPERS uh, position today uh, is, is a reasonable position. It's a, it's a reasonable balance of, of risk. It's a reasonable uh, balance of, of uh, dealing with volatility. And we don't see any really significant evidence that, uh, that has been presented that, that shows that CalPERS should be changing uh, the asset allocation or the discount rate at this point. Uh, if I may, first, uh, let's kind of picture the overall situation in terms of, of the money issue at the city level, and that's what I can talk about the best. Uh, and that is that really it, one of two things happens. When, when you have a payroll, and I'll just give you an example. If I do nothing in my city, I do absolutely uh, nothing. Just continue on as we're going, no new MOU, MOU constant. My cost between pension and retired medical benefits and increase in regular medical, medical benefits goes up about 5% a year if I just do nothing. So the impact is that has to come from somewhere. Now, what happens is it's usually if there's no new revenue and revenue is going up maybe 2 3% a year, we could count on that for the next few years. When you process that all out, basically it's a reduction in service, and that can come a lot of different ways, and sometimes it does come in a reduction of employees or trying to uh, you know, somehow corral your cost of an increasing payroll. 
And I know we're not going to get in that discussion today, but it sure begs the question of have we at the local level, and I'll just speak for us, overpromised? And do we really need to deal, as we have now on a go-forward basis, uh, with uh, employees coming in, but do we need to address the cost of uh, current employees? I, I think that's a valid question that we should be asking ourselves. Because I can tell you right now, that's why I'm so afraid of the future of cities based on this increasing cost of just carrying our current uh, payroll. So, uh, you know, I think the point that David made about how much we need to change uh, the uh, discount rate is a valid consideration, but on the other hand, you don't want to get to the point where you're not properly funding your retirees. And I think one of the things that you guys benefit from that other of these uh, statistics uh, and organizations that, uh, that David was mentioning from is you have much better research and much better information, so you're able to make a more refined decision. And I think that's what you're hearing for your economic staff and your actuarial staff is, hey, maybe that rate does need to come down another quarter of a percent. So if I were responding to Robert's questions, I'll be honest with you, I'd, I'd have a tough time, but I think you're a little bit somewhere between your lower risk portfolio and your base case is something you need to take a look at. And uh, I know we're only talking about a quarter of a percent difference, but that does mean quite a bit of money as to the rates that cities would have to pay. And that base case still has the potential of not changing the discount rate, but shifting our asset allocation mix. JJ? The part of what we are responding to, quite frankly, is the political pressure that, you know, we're, our assumptions are too high. Um, the, and I keep pointing out those arguments are not coming from our friends. Um, but there is a trade-off between the contribution, the employer contributions and employee contributions as well, and the risk we run and the funding status. Uh, what I'm hearing is, at least from the two <laughs> employers, is you really want stability. Um, and so, I mean, one of the things we could do is say, okay, the, the contribution rate is 50%. Anything above what we actually need will be used to reduce the employer contribution the unfunded liability would get it paid off fairly quickly. That would give you stability, uh, but I suspect that that's not really <coughs> what you want. And I'm also, I am also and have expressed the concern that we have overlearned the lesson from 0809. But comment on just how important is stability? I think stability is is key for us. And at the forum a couple weeks ago, you know, there was a lot of discussion about people advance paying their unfunded liability, and that's something that I'm definitely putting on my work plan for 2014, uh, because I'm really not earning that much interest on our portfolio. And if I can pay down some of our unfunded. I will save our customers a lot of money over the long term. So a point when I was reading the materials a second time last night is that I think de-risking is very important to us as we get closer to being 100% funded. Um, because if this were my money, I would call it good and uh, you know become very conservative in my investments once I got fully funded. So I think this is very important. The discount rate is very important. Uh, me and my board president came here a couple of years ago uh, requesting that you would not lower the discount rate. But I'm starting to think that if, if our goal is the discount rate, that might be a, a backwards way of, of looking at funding this plan. I, um, I understand there's political pressures um, all over the place. We've felt it. Um, but I think what's right for the plan, a decision should be made based on, on the merits of that and not just the discount rate. But you also realize that when we reduce the discount rate, it increases the unfunded. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the cash flows don't change, but the reporting number changes. Right. Other <coughs> questions from board members or executive staff? Otherwise, we'll come back to the panel. Mr. Slayton. Yeah, I'd like other, I, I don't know who actually was able to hear the whole uh, discussion yesterday, but we spent a lot of time talking about de-risking and, and in particular uh, focusing on de-risking when we had a very good year. 
so that the uh, uh, contribution rates or the contributions that the cash that had to be uh, submitted by jurisdictions uh, might not go up as high as it would otherwise go up uh, if we were to apply the risking. And I'd, I'd like uh, comments from uh, panelists. Uh, you, you started this commentary, and I'd like the others to continue it a little bit on the comments on yesterday. I, we think that that's a, a legitimate discussion. You know, JJ brings up a point. We could, you know, we could de-risk many ways. We, we, we could ask employers to pay a huge amount now and, and bring us to full funding, and we'd break every budget in California, and everybody would be in San Bernardino's shoes. So obviously, uh, you know, risk comes with a cost. Uh, you know, de-risking comes with a cost. And, and you know, we, you talk about if it was your own finances. Well, you know, you wouldn't be paying your home mortgage down when your income has just dropped and you've just taken furloughs and you don't have enough money to put food on your table to send your kids to school. So what you do is you, you start paying it down when you get more disposable income. So it just seems to me that, that you do this um, asset allocation review and cycles and you have to take into consideration the cycle that you're in when you make some of these decisions. And as I said earlier, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're in this particular funding cycle right now. We're in a particular uh, economic cycle. We are also are dealing with uh, the mortality and the, and the smoothing decisions. So you can't make an asset allocation and discount rate decision in a vacuum. You have to take into consideration, you know, all the various factors. And it would make a lot more sense to us for you to be looking at some of the de-risking uh, decisions uh, in, in, a, in a period of time where, where the economy has been recovering and we have seen the impact of the recovery a little bit and that would certainly mitigate you know the, the, the how, how much the employees and the employers would feel the impacts of your decisions. I, I just just want to make sure I understand what you said because we were talking the other day about about yesterday about taking advantage of a particular high return year to get a chance to do some de-risking in that moment. Uh, and what I hear you saying is take a longer view of what the overall economy is doing before you do that. So I, I just want to make sure I'm yeah, communicating. I, I, I think both are worth considering. I mean, okay. I think I, we're, not, we're not saying don't take advantage of, of high return years to try to, to, try to mitigate you know, risk. Um, that makes sense as well. You know, the devil's in the details there. I was uh, able to hear most of the presentation yesterday, and uh, just for a simple answer, I think the concept of, uh, of de-risking uh, when you have your better return years uh, makes sense, and again, uh, contributes to what Kerry said earlier, helping the overall stability. So we won't see any big drops, but on the other hand, we won't see any big increases. Ron, any thoughts on the de-risking issue of well, if you saw my portfolio, you'd realize I don't understand anything about de-risking. <laughs> uh, however, I, I do I do understand what's being said here, and I was unable because of the meeting yesterday to to either participate or view uh, what was what was done yesterday. But I I do recall from from history and from that era and being involved in pension reform ever since Schwarzenegger got up here, uh, is that when there was extreme market rises that CalPERS was in a high-risk situation. I believe you were heavily involved in real estate at the time, and real estate is what, re what really took a dump, and nobody was looking at that. But, I mean, as I, I'm not an investment guru, so I don't know how you can predict these things. But it seems like, um, I'll go back to one a, a, a person I worked for in the Sheriff's Department when I was doing patrol work, is that, that uh, during lulls in activity, Sometimes departments tend to stand down a little bit, and the, he said, really, statistically, that's when you need to gear up because that's when you can get ahead of the situation instead of standing down and then waiting till things happen, happen and then trying to gear up again. It's kind of like a plane trying to take off and land every, every few miles. It you just uses up a lot of fuel. So trying to get to a por portfolio that's more stabilized, that does lower your risk, and again, I don't know how to suggest that, but I, I think you've got a couple of good avenues here to do that, would probably benefit CalPERS and would probably benefit the employer and would definitely benefit the employee because it, it's, it's going to make it a little bit easier for them going forward and, and looking at things as they, as they go along. Like I said, right now, uh, 
we've all gone and we've tried to help and we've tried to take these hits and try to help absorb things. So now looking at, and again, like Dave said, the, the rumors that are going on out there are pretty wild about what is going to happen, what's going to happen to the employee. And it seems like JJ talked about, you know, bending to the political pressure out there. We have seen more political pressure from the media on these issues than we have in the last 15 years. Uh, and actually, it seems like they have turned on the public employees and they have turned on the retirement systems. The retirement systems that <coughs> there's been some volatility, but over the last several decades have actually been very stable in the way you've met your obligations. And as I understand, as it keeps getting reported that over the last 30 years, you've hit your assumed rate. You've hit your, your, what, your, your goal. So it, it's kind of like if we can continue doing that and de-risk and go forward and look at these other things, then maybe we will be in a better position. But we need to give time for some of these things that have been in place, have just started to come in place, give them a chance to work. I think we're, we're looking to panic when we, we need to look and step back and see what we've done and where we're going. Mr. Deer. Thank you. Um, well, you know, we're, I find us in a very untenable situation. The elephant in the room is liabilities, and Mr. Bates touched on this. The discount rate change, the, the level we're talking about, does, has a little impact, but not very much. Um, uh, with the, uh, the liabilities, I'm in the uh, state miscellaneous, 2% at 55. I consider 36 years to be a reasonable career in which to base your pension on. 36 years with Social Security, uh, and I'm at the at the uh, upper end of the salary as far as Social Security contributions goes, gives me a salary of 120% of my, um, excuse me, a pension of 120% of my highest salary. That's um, I mean, I think that kind of level is, is beyond what we would call uh, retirement security. Um, I didn't have uh, that many years with uh, uh, CalPERS because I had 20 years previously with the University of Washington, but um, uh, it's, again, the liability side of this equation is, is uh, not, all we can do to that liability side is make small changes through the, through the discount rate. but. Uh, the sort of the real liability, getting away from the accounting of it, is uh, is very large and and growing. Any comments uh, Mr. to that? Well, I'd just like to uh, respond to a couple things to that. First of all, um, not everybody can can work a thirty six year career. Um, you know, if you're working as a as a, a carpenter or a groundskeeper, thirty six years, your your body starts to wear down, and a lot of uh, uh, people in, in in some of the public service jobs work in, in very you know. Uh, hard blue collar jobs. Secondly, for, if you're a classified employee, over 50% of our members work part time. So if you're working four hours a day, you got to work two years to get one year service credit. So that means you have to work 72 years. I don't think that's going to happen to too many of our, for many of our members. So, you know, I think that, that we have to look at uh, the situation uh, con contextually. And then also in terms of just uh, context, um, we, if you look at 1980, Back the last time Jerry Brown was governor, CalPERS was funded at about 55 percent. So we had an unfunded liability of, of 45 percent in 1980, and the employer contributions were uh, at some of their highest points. You know, for the schools, it was 13.04 percent. And over time, Cal between 1980 and today, today we had a point where we were super funded, um, had uh, more than 100 percent funded, and the employer contribution rates went down to zero for about five, six years, and employers took pension holidays. So you know, I think it's just important that we don't look at the situation we're in today, and, and because of the, uh, the people who have been very critical of pensions, that we allow them to sway the discussion so far to the other side that, that we react in ways that are not long-term responsible. I'd, I'd like to uh, comment, because you're right, you, you, we're addressing the elephant in the room. And it would be nice if most of the uh, employees that are working at the city level that are full-time fit into the category uh, that David just uh, explained. Uh, unfortunately, when I look at my city, most of our employees, well, all of our employees are basically miscellaneous employees at 2.5 and have careers, uh, even in public works, well 
into 20, in fact, I just gave last night seven awards for 25 years of service. Those are all what we call orange shirts, our line employees. We've got a lot of miscellaneous employees that are uh, at uh, 2.7 in the city I came from in, in Southgate. So uh, the costs uh, to cities, and then if you get over into the uh, public safety side, I mean, then, then you're really breaking the bank here because you're talking about 3%. And I'm not arguing against all the work and the cuts that public safety took in many cases to get those 3% uh, uh, retirement rates. But that's the elephant in the room. That's what's driving these costs for cities up. You know, as I say, in our case, at 5% a year that are just unsustainable. Something has to give. Either cities go bankrupt and we realign it through that process, which we're going to see the outcome from here, I guess, when we decide what happens in Detroit, or we start dealing with the elephant in the room, which is we probably made some mistakes in 1999 when everybody jumped on that accelerated pension bandwagon and, and promised things that are very difficult for us to keep now. Other comments, questions to that? Thank you, Mr. Deer. So the last question then that I want to throw out to our panel so we'll have some time for public comment from those in the audience is just sort of trying to wrap up and summarize the advice that you would give to our board members in that context of things have been difficult. We've, we've had difficult times. It's a difficult environment. We, we all recognize that, whether you're the, the member that has made significant sacrifices and had cuts and furloughs or the employer who's dealing with these straining budgets. As far as your your advice to the board in this current environment, looking at the decisions that the board has made and the things that the board will continue to look to in the future, the risk levels and the, the rate volatility, the contribution levels, any final thoughts that each of you might be able to share from what you've heard with the other panelists and the board member comments? All right, so I think we've been playing catch up uh, for the decisions that have been made in the past, and um, you know we're we're facing the the new smoothing and amortization methodologies. GASB is also requiring us to make some big changes in our financial statements, um, and I'm in a good position in that I'm in a healthy organization, um, but around me there are organizations that are struggling. Um, so these are a lot of decisions for either a healthy or unhealthy organization to make at one time. Um, my recommendation would be, or my suggestion is, um, these changes need to be moderate and made over a period of time. Um, and I think that would help us um, be able to forecast these numbers and you know give us as much information in advance so we can be prepared um, as we move forward and adjust our budgets um, because for sure for a, a special district a water district like us we do not want a raise in our employee benefits to drive a, a water rate increase that is unacceptable to us so we need as much lead time as possible so we can um, you know be flexible and, and move things around in our organization Thanks, Gary. Ron? Well, we're, 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 Carrie's organization has, for lack of a better term, sort of the luxury. If they get a, a employer internal cost increase, then the rates go up to their customers. Their customers will yell at them. But the only thing we can do is if we get these things is we have to go back to the table and they have to go back to the employees. But I do want to touch on, on something that, that George said. When the great majority of our my members and school employees, I'm, I'm not sure about the uh, part-time workers, we don't, we aren't in Social Security. So we won't have an additional sum besides our retirement. And even the ones that are, because of uh, GPO and WEP, they really won't get back, uh, they'll get back just a very small percentage of what they've put in. So they'll be sacrificing what they've paid. They've been a contributor to Social Security, they won't be a, a a real beneficiary of Social Security. So that's what they look at going forward. So they rely on on that pension. And only 1%, uh, this is a number that uh, Ron Sealing threw out one time in a presentation that in the safety side, only about 1% ever reach a 30-year career because of, of the things that go on. I've been very lucky. I'm in a 40-year career. Uh, but I think being on full release to PORAC the last 10 years is probably a uh, saved a lot of wear and tear that I otherwise would have had on the streets. So that, that's probably helped elongate my career. The, uh, I think if, 
again, I would echo what Ms. Corder said, that if we can look at moderation, uh, de-risking, and I would ask that the, my, from my member's perspective that the, that the discount rate or assumed rate of return not be reduced again. I think we still need to look at the longer picture, and I think we need to look at what has been done. Again, as said before, we have PEPRA, we have higher cost sharing uh, going on. These things need to have a chance to play out before we take a drastic step. We need to take a, a more moderate, well-thought-out approach going forward. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> Let me just reiterate what I kind of said earlier, and that is I'm, I'm kind of somewhere between the base case and, and the uh, lower risk approach. Uh, it, and I do think that's a decision, obviously, that your board will have to consider. I think a good argument could be made for the, the lower risk approach. And, and just generally, let, let me talk a little bit about risk, having heard your uh, presentations uh, yesterday, and, and my background is a certified financial planner, and my uh, doctoral work is all uh, in basically public finance. And I would just say that I know hearing some of the arguments that I heard yesterday, and, and you know, can you beat the market consistently? Can't you beat the market? I mean, those those arguments are still going on in, at Wall Street. I mean, there you, you get John Brennan and all the Vanguard Group, and they'll tell you, hey, invest all your money uh, in. Uh, uh, in uh, index funds that you're going to do just as well long term uh, as the market's going to do. So I want to take that comment and apply it to your absolute return strategies where I was hearing the discussion uh, yesterday quite a bit. I'm not suggesting that you, you don't get heavily involved in those uh, strategies, but when you're talking about picking uh, managers in, in classes that can consistently beat the market and moving from manager to manager over time, I would just advise some real caution in that area. I'm not, I'm not trying to turn over the very fine staff you have and the work they do. I would just advise caution because I think what we know is over time, uh, uh, everything tends toward the mean. So uh, to, beat, uh, to beat the market over, over time, uh, these managers have to be very good, have to be consistently very good, and uh, your staff has to find them at the right time when they're peaking and not going down. So I guess I would just advise real caution uh, in that area as you go from you know, zero to one or, or, or two percent in that area. So thank you, and thank you for inviting us to the league to participate today. Thank you, Ron. Dave, before we go, do you have a question or a comment from our actuary? Alan? Yeah, I'd uh, like some clarification from Ron there. Um, <laughs> the, if we go with a rate of return that's much less than the base case, it re really would uh, require us to look at a lower <laughs> discount rate. Um, and I, I sense that what you're really looking for is something a bit less risky than what we've got, but maybe not as m much as the lower risk. Would adoption of, say, a base case um, or, or a, a portfolio similar to the base case, but also with a flexible de-risking, uh, a commitment to flexible de-risking, would that be kind of a, something that you would find acceptable? Uh, my reaction, Alan, yeah, I, th I think you're headed in the right direction with a combination of those. That, that, that may work for us. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, it's going to be a challenge for all cities, but we can't keep kicking, the, we can't kick the can down the road. And, and I think city managers, finance directors, and cities realize that. And so we've got to face up to it. We made commitments. Uh, hopefully, at some point, we'll get a chance to address some of those commitments going forward. So thank you. And I think also we have different terminology. One person's kicking the can down the road might be someone else's let's have time for the pepper reforms and for the smoothing policy and for the last discount rate reduction to sort of settle out and work. So it and not make, and make sure we don't drop below 50% funded, right? We're heading in that opposite direction okay. towards full funding. <laughs> so, Dave? Um, I want to thank, thank you for, for the thoughtful approach you're, you're, you're putting into this. Um, you know, we understand that CalPERS uh, is only a piece of the puzzle here. You know, uh, we talk about the uh, the 
employer plans and the various plans from 2 to 2.7 percent. CalPERS doesn't create the formulas. CalPERS doesn't negotiate with the employee organizations. CalPERS administers the plan. And it seems that in the press oftentimes CalPERS ends up taking some of the blame for things that other uh, that agencies do to themselves. I think the agencies have to take a certain level of responsibility for the fact that they're the ones that created those plans and they have to fund them. Uh, CalPERS, I don't believe CalPERS, uh, it's a legitimate um, uh, charge that CalPERS has kicked the can down the road. The CalPERS has, I think, done a, a reasonable job of, of uh, investing the money and paying out the benefits and, and making assumptions in a way that is financially responsible and has done a, a good job of being prudent about that. CalPERS does have to look at these decisions uh, from a global perspective, I believe. You can't make these decisions in a vac vacuum. You, you live in the real world and your decisions have impact on people in the real world. So, you know, the, it, it would be a simpler solution just to look at it from the CalPERS pers perspective and say, what kind of decisions can we make to insulate ourselves from criticism? What kind of decisions can we make to make sure that, 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 that you know, we have enough money? Well, when, when, when you're bringing in more money to make those decisions to insulate yourself, uh, you're having an impact on, on agencies and you're having an impact on your members and real people and their finances and the bills that they have to pay. So I just think that, that you do have to take into consideration the fact that 400 plus local agencies have negotiated contracts with their unions to increase the amount the employees are paying in some, in some agencies substantially more and in some cases double digits more out of their paychecks during an economic recession for their own pensions. I think that needs to be taken into consideration. I think PEPRA does need to be taken into consideration. The fact that Proposition 30 is passed and we have an economic recovery. The fact that CalPERS, we believe, is better positioned to take advantage of the economic recovery today than you were uh, when it first started in 2008. Uh, the fact that over the long term things change and you know it's not uh, just a snapshot of where we are today and the fact that these decisions also have political ramifications. We have you know folks that would like to change the Constitution. We have folks that would like to, to, to go to the ballot and, and, and change benefits and uh, your decisions do have ramifications on those types of campaigns. And I just don't think you can make these decisions without at least considering all of these factors. Thank you very much. I want to uh, appreciate and tell our panelists how much their input means to the board and to the staff. It's exactly what we've been looking for, to, to hear your perspectives and to see how these things impact your organizations and your members. And it's valuable for us and want to have all of you join me in thanking our panelists today. At this point, we have time for public comment, and I, I have them. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Yeah, we do have three um, uh, individuals that have requested to speak. But before I call on them, I just want to get a clarification. Maybe Dave knows the answer. But, Ron, you mentioned that uh, classified employees in school districts are not in Social Security. But I recall in the late 60s, the school districts were given the option to allow their employees to join Social Security in a uh, no LA Unified did, so every new employee after that date had to go into Social Security. And I'm just wondering, is that a statewide uh, situation? It's, it now? varies. I, I would say that probably 80% of the school employees are in Social Security. About 20% are in districts that opted out. So it's really uh, firefighters, police, and teachers are the three categories that are not in Social Security. Okay, thank you. I think in my comment, I, what, I, what I said today was I'm, I'm not sure how many yeah, uh, of his right. em, of CSEA employees are in Social Security. Right. I know in safety it's very sure. few, right. and I think teachers, uh, most of the teachers are not in, not, in Social right. Security unless they had a previous job where they were. Yeah. In. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have three people, and I'm going to ask uh, the three individuals if we could, uh, Ben, Allen, and Shara, if we could use those three seats uh, to allow the. Um, public speakers to come up, and that will be uh, Randall Cheek, Mark Klein, and Dennett Murphy. If you could come to the front and take those three seats. Randy Cheek with SEIU Local 1000. Uh, yesterday, uh, I attended the session, and, and it was noted that uh, you discussed a lot about the uh, hedge funds. 
uh, whether they were uh, part of the asset class or whether they were part of the global equity. And, and, and as, as hedge funds become more of your decision, I'd like to point out that, one, that they're very costly. Two, that some of the people behind the hedge funds, like John Arnold, uh, Mr. Enron, is also going after public pensions. And there are others in the hedge fund industry that are going after public pensions. Uh, you know, oftentimes when I talk to my members about these issues, one of the things that I always comment to them is, don't ever buy Georgia Pacific products. Because if you buy Georgia Pacific products, you're putting money into the people, hands of people who want to do away with your pensions and your health care. And so I'd like to point out that some of these hedge funds out there are putting up the money to go after CalPERS and STRS and other public pensions. And I caution uh, you on uh, those type of uh, folks uh, using our money uh, as public employees to go after our own pensions. Uh, ah, OK. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mark Klein. I'm um, Secure Retirement Coordinator for SEIU Local 721. Uh, we represent approximately 86,000 members in Southern California in the counties of uh, uh, Los Angeles, Ventura, uh, Riverside, and uh, Santa Barbara. Um, approximately 13,000 of our members um, are covered by CalPERS in more than, well, almost 50 uh, cities and agencies. So it's a fairly small number for, you know, it's a rather... Uh, uh, a small number of employees per uh, per city, and I think you get an idea from that that you have a lot of small cities in that group. Um, it includes, by the way, Pico Rivera, uh, and uh, and by the way, I just want to say that Pico Rivera is not typical of many of the other cities that we do cover. Pico Rivera is very fortunate in having a decent tax base. You have a lot of hotels there, uh, and you know the money is pretty good. And zero contribution. Okay. Well, we can yeah, we can go back to the table at some point on that. Um, um, remember, every time that you raise employer rates, either directly or indirectly, you are raising employee rates. You go back to the bargaining table, and we always are going back to the bargaining table, and the employer is going to try to push as much of that as they possibly can on employees. So it is an utter misnomer for you to think that, well, this is just affecting employers. It affects all the employees. Obviously, something that would impact, affect the employees even more would be bankruptcy. A lot of these small cities and agencies are on the bubble. They are already uh, very concerned about the smoothing decision that you made in March. Um, and they know that they, they, they can foresee that with, I think it's in 20, is it 2014 or 2015 the smoothing kicks in? Uh, you have seven years of increased employer contributions of 50%. Again, that's going to come to the employees. And some of the cities are not even going to make it past that. If you lower the assumed rate of return, on addition, in addition to the uh, smoothing change that you made, you are creating potential chaos in a lot of small cities which means a lot of employees. You know, sustainability is a two-way street. I've said this before. It's a two-way street. It's not simply the sustainability of the fund. And obviously, all the political pressure is on CalPERS uh, to become fully funded. And I understand that, and it's a lovely day when that happens. But you know, when CalPERS was not necessarily fully funded, didn't really have a hell of a lot of problems paying the benefit. And they were able to pay it off on a, timely, uh, on a timely basis, as was necessary. Clearly, you want to lower the liability. Um, but there are other aspects to that as well. Um, let me just check my thing. Um, there, it's not just political pressure, really, that's been going on. We have seen political hysteria out there, really, since the crash. You know, a lot of people point to 1999 as a date when everything sort of began going to hell in a handbasket for, uh, for pensions in the state of California. Uh, that's a reasonable argument. I'm sure there were decisions that were made there were not, that were not the best decisions. However, the worst decision that was made that affected uh, CalPERS 
and the, the economy way more than the decisions made uh, by the California State Legislature was a decision made by the U.S. Congress when they eliminated Glass-Steagall. And everything that we have faced since then, the, uh, the proliferation of too big to fail, the use of uh, collateralized debt obligations as, as investment vehicles based on, uh, on leverage and debt, um, the subprime mortgage crisis, which meant, led to the housing bubble crash, has utterly crushed the economy and the middle class in this country. Uh, so I think you really need to look at where, uh, if you're going to point fingers of blame, please do not forget that incredibly bad, stupid, short-sighted decisions were made by people who, frankly, had a direct interest in making that money. Phil Graham's uh, wife, for example, uh, made a ton of money on that as a financial advisor. Um, what George Deere was mentioning, God bless you, George, 36 years, getting 120% of your salary. Um, if you want to give away 20% of that somewhere, I can think of some places. That's an anecdote. It's certainly true to George, and I'm sure it's true to a lot of other people, but it's an anecdote. I'm old enough, I have the gray hair to prove it, uh, that I remember when Ronald Reagan became president, he used anecdotes about welfare mothers driving Cadillacs, and that completely was used to totally change the welfare system in this country. You can argue whether it was a good change or a bad change, but it was based on anecdotes and not actual, uh, not real figures. Um, there are a lot of elephants in the room. Yes, liabilities are an elephant in the room, uh, but so is the elimination of Glass-Steagall. So is the fact that Wall Street has gotten away with, frankly, criminal behavior over the last well, since 1999, I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> I just want to urge you to please consider the cities, the employees. Look at a time factor. Do not lower the assumed rate of return. The worst thing for CalPERS for you to face would be more San Bernardinos, more Stocktons, more, more cities going into bankruptcies. And you will see it if you lower that assumed rate. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think you sold, uh, stole a good bit of the wind in my sails here. Um, just a few comments. Uh, this asset allocation workshop, um, I've been doing this for 14 years, and this is the, uh, and I've gone to lots of these kinds of workshops, both at CalPERS as well as other pension funds. This is the most vibrant and uh, meaningful um, two days or, or a set of discussions, comments, presentations that I've ever seen. And I just wanted to thank um, Joe and um, the investment staff, um, particularly Eric and Ben, for um, raising a, a critique of modern portfolio theory and the efficient market hypothesis. I appreciate that. Um, also want to thank um, uh, Alan and um, Cheryl for, uh, and the investment staff for their work to integrate uh, liabilities and investments. I think this is a really important process. I think it's fairly unique and um, even though it's very challenging. Uh, I also want to suggest that perhaps Alan have a bell someplace near him so that every time he says we're going, you know, this may increase employer contributions that the bell rings and he says, oh yes, and employee contributions too. <laughs> um, those of us on that side of the table um, are very aware of that and as, as Mark suggested, our members um, are getting killed at the bargaining table. Not that employers don't have meaningful challenges as well. Um, I want to suggest that uh, there's been lots of talk about elephants in the room. I think, I think the downside risk is, the, is kind of the elephant in the room. And uh, there's lots of discussion about that, lots of fear. Um, that goes back to the finance industry in 02 and 09, and actually many years before that, going back to the repeal of Glass-Steagall, um, uh, bringing down the economy. Um, 
that's a fact. Henry, you've asked why aren't more people going to jail? I mean, it's a, it's a, real, it's a real important question. Um, you have, there have been several references to investment beliefs in uh, the investment beliefs that you recently adopted this fall that I think are a hugely meaningful uh, document uh, and guide for CalPERS investment decision making. Um, there's a sustainability belief in there um, that talks about uh, a lot, it talks about the financial markets. And, you know, I would hope that the board and the staff over the coming months as you have opportunities will continue to integrate those investment beliefs into your decision making process. Um, in that view, the elephant in the room I think deserves particular attention. The downside risk so feared is really the fear of unre unregulated finance market players bringing down the economy again. And I think that perhaps, well, I would suggest that we all have an obligation not only to do good asset allocation decisions, but also to really focus and make a priority everything that we can possibly do, all of us, and I think CalPERS has a platform here to be a national and international leader, to make the markets uh, make market safety and soundness a priority. And that means, that means resources. That means, you know, figuring out how you have the best representation in Washington, D.C. And I would even suggest that having staff members, board members, and others go to Washington, D.C. and meet with members of Congress to make the case, doing everything that we possibly can to make the market safe and sound will go a long way towards that downside risk, which I think is, again, the elephant in the room. It's the finance industry. So with that, I just want to thank you again for a meaningful two days. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And again, we want to thank the panel for their participation and uh, very good uh, information and good dialogue. So at this time, why don't we take a break for 15 minutes?